Today, we cover some of the most brutal and savage big cat attack stories we've covered on this channel all year. From lions, tigers, mountain lions, and jaguars, this video is sure to make you think twice about going into the woods ever again. Hit that like button and subscribe right now. These are the deadliest big cat attacks of 2023. Welcome to Final Affliction. Alexandra Black had graduated from Indiana University Bloomington and was pursuing a career in zoology. She had studied the integrative study of animal behavior and was determined to land a job working with animals. She had already worked as an intern at three different wildlife sanctuaries and reserves in the U.S. This was a step towards making a full-time living doing something that she loved. In December 2018, she began her fourth internship this time at the Conservators Center in Burlington, North Carolina. Her previous internships included working at an Indiana Wolf Research Center and Wildcat Creek Wildlife Center. The center, founded in 1999, is home to around 20 big cats, including lions, tigers, and leopards. They drew in thousands of visitors to the center each year. Alexandra was being shown the ropes in the first few days of the job. She workshadowed the staff there, learning the routine and understanding the needs of the various different animals they cared for. In most zoos and wildlife sanctuaries, only fully trained staff have access to the animal enclosures. Some have a complicated locking mechanism to ensure the safety of staff, such as keys that can't be removed from a lock unless it is locked properly, or hydraulic action gates. Some zoos require a minimum of six months' work experience at the vicinity until staff are deemed competent enough to hold the keys for a specific enclosure. The Conservatorist Center also had stringent measures in place to ensure the safety of the staff, general public, and the animals themselves. But on Alexandra's 10th day working at the center, something went badly wrong. The measures they had in place failed, causing catastrophic results. Many of the 15 lions they kept at the facility were rescued from appalling conditions. They had been kept in tiny cages, treated badly, and malnourished. Matai was one of the lions who had been rescued from these conditions from Ohio in 2004. Haunted by his past, he was nervous by nature, but enthusiastically received attention from the keepers he had grown to trust. On December 30th, 2018, Alexandra's 10th day at the facility. She joined the husbandry team to carry out routine cleaning in the lion enclosure. She was under the supervision of a professionally trained animal keeper. Each section of the enclosure was secured from the next. Trained personnel opened and closed the gates between the sections, but on this particular occasion, a large play ball rolled into the gateway. As the gate swung to a close, it was blocked from fastening shut by the ball. A freak accident, a one in a million accident that was to prove fatal. Matai nudged the gate with his snout. It swung open. He walked through, his huge paws stepping onto the cold, hard concrete. He was now just feet away from the staff who were sweeping up the inner section. Unbeknown to Alexandra and the other staff, there was now nothing between the huge male lion and them. No wire or fencing, no gates or locks. Matai sniffed the ground. He lifted his head and proceeded forwards, silently stepping forwards. His usually timid nature was overpowered by his natural instinct. He saw the young intern just feet from where he was standing, and he lunged at her. He grabbed her by the ankle and pulled her to the floor. Alexandra kicked and thrashed around trying to release her foot from the lion's grip, but the 500-pound, 230-kilogram lion pulled her into his outer enclosure. Animal trainer Ashley Watts, who was working with Alexandra at the time, jumped into action. She desperately tried to separate the lion from the young intern, trying to distract him and lure him away, but Matai was fixated on Alexandra. He then leapt on top of Alexandra and instinctively went for her neck. He closed his crushing jaws around her windpipe and dragged her around his enclosure, scraping her over the concrete. Alexandra was still alive at this point, 
Her colleagues screamed and shouted at the lion and immediately called for backup. Ashley Watts ran for a hose pipe and powered it at the lion, but to no avail. Matai was not budging. Soaking his face, aiming at his eyes and his snout, he didn't flinch. By now, Alexandra was bleeding profusely from the neck. The lion's three-inch, seven-centimeter canines had cut deeply into her flesh, severing her arteries and fracturing her spinal cord. But Alexandra had fought back. Despite the incredible power of the 14-year-old lion's bite and being dragged around the enclosure by her neck, the young intern put up an impressive fight. She had punched and pulled, scrabbled and hit the lion with her arms as she began to lose consciousness. The autopsy report shows remarkable defensive wounds on Alexandra's arms from fighting back. She fought until the end. Matai readjusted his grip, puncturing Alexandra's skull, and his claws dug into her shoulder, chest, and back. The young woman, who had dreamed of working with these animals for so long, now lay limp in the captive lion's enclosure. Through no fault of her own, she had lost her life that day. There was nothing anybody could do to try and get to Alexandra before it was too late. The attack had been rapid, it had been brutal, and the severe injuries Alexandra had sustained were inflicted in a matter of seconds. The Caswell County Sheriff's Office responded to the distress call. Its deputies arrived just before midday. Upon arrival, they noticed a lion running around inside an enclosure with several people running around the outside of it. One of the police officers grabbed his 12-gauge shotgun from the trunk of his patrol car and ran over to the commotion. The center was ill-prepared for an eventuality like this. There were no tranquilizers near the lion's enclosure, and the staff were desperately trying to usher the lion back into his indoor pen, but it wasn't working. To the officers that arrived on scene, it looked like chaos. The lion was not listening to his handlers, and he continued to pace around his enclosure, preventing anyone from getting close to Alexandra. Even when the tranquilizer darts finally arrived on the scene, one gun jammed and they had to run about, trying to find another. They lured the lion closer to the fence with raw meat, and then the center's CEO Doug Evans fired the tranquilizer darts into the lion. The lion flinched, but the medicine didn't take effect. Staff tried again, firing a second dart into the lion's muscle. Again, he didn't respond to the anesthetic. They tried once more. When three tranquilizers didn't bring the lion down, the sheriff's department gave the order to shoot and kill the lion. They needed to get to Alexandra. They needed to try and rescue her. Maybe there was still a chance they could resuscitate her. After seven shots from the shotgun, the lion fell to the ground but an eighth was shot into the animal's heart to make sure he was dead. Matai finally succumbed, breathing his last breath. It is hard to imagine that captive animals can deliver such devastating damage, having never set foot in the wild. But the fact of the matter is that these animals are still technically wild. They still have thousands of years of natural instinct within their DNA. That hunting instinct is still strong. Even those born and bred in captivity can turn on their keepers without warning, having spent years within a familiar environment. The Conservatory Center in Burlington had been inspected just months before Alexandra's fatal attack. In April 2018, the U.S. Department of Agriculture found nothing of concern or out of compliance. There had been no workplace safety complaints made by employees at the center. An earlier inspection in 2017 also found the facility to comply with all safety regulations and procedures. It seems that this was an accident, a tragic and freak accident with no one to blame. Known by her friends as Alex, following her death it was obvious how much of an impact she had on people's lives. Her passion for animals and conservation were clear through her work, and her colleagues were always impressed by Alex's hardworking ethos. She had an unrivaled enthusiasm for the job and a permanent smile across her face that lit up any room she walked into. The death of anyone so young is tragic, but losing a passionate conservationist like Alex was a loss for the entire zoological and conservation community. The amazing person that she was will always shine brighter than the terrifying lion attack 
that led to her final affliction. The Siberian tiger, sometimes referred to as the Amur tiger, is one of the most majestic animals on Earth and is the largest of all big cats. It is a species of tiger native to the forests of Russia, China, and North Korea. It is distinguished by its enormous size and powerful strength. To put it into perspective, some males weigh up to 660 pounds, equivalent to the weight of a large motorcycle. In addition to their massive size and strength, Siberian tigers have an incredible bite force comparable to that of a hydraulic press or a large crocodile. It is estimated that their bite force is around 1,000 pounds per square inch, strong enough to crush bones and kill large prey, like elk, with a single bite. A human's bite force is only around 160 pounds per square inch. Consequently, the Siberian tiger has one of the strongest bites of any land mammal, helping them become one of the most feared predators in the wild. If that's not enough, Siberian tigers are also powerful swimmers and are not averse to entering the water to hunt or escape danger. While these creatures are highly reclusive, they are at the absolute top of the food chain. Needless to say, they are incredibly dangerous to humans, especially if threatened or provoked. However, because these creatures are now considered endangered, conservation and protection efforts have been made throughout the years, including keeping tigers in zoos. Unfortunately, Siberian tigers have large home ranges, and being kept in a zoo may decrease the tiger's well-being, making them more agitated. Some people prod tease or otherwise provoke the animals in the zoo, hoping to invoke an exciting reaction from the animal, which creates a dangerous situation. This was the case with Carlos Sousa Jr. and his friends on that fateful Christmas day in 2007. It was June 25, 2003. The Denver Zoo was home to a small population of Siberian tigers. These magnificent creatures were part of a carefully managed breeding program that aimed to conserve and increase the genetic diversity of the species. In a large enclosure, a female Siberian tiger was born. The zookeepers and caretakers named it Tatiana. Born in captivity, Tatiana was not really an aggressive tiger and had no problems with people. On December 16, 2005, she was taken and permanently moved to the San Francisco Zoo to mate with a 14-year-old Siberian tiger named Tony. Everything was well until December 22, 2006, when Tatiana attacked her veteran zookeeper, Lori Komajan. In trying to feed her, Lori violated safety protocols and entered the tiger's enclosure alone without proper notification to other staff members. As Lori approached, Tatiana attacked her by biting and clawing at her, seriously injuring Lori's head, neck, and upper body. Hearing Lori's screams, the other staff members rushed to the scene to help. Thankfully, they were able to safely remove Lori from the enclosure and call for medical assistance. Unfortunately, this wasn't the last time Tatiana would make headlines. It was December 25, 2007. Carlos Sousa Jr. and his friends, brothers Amrit Paul and Colbert Dhaliwal, arrived at the San Francisco Zoo, excited to see the animals up close. Carlos was 17 years old at the time, while Amrit Paul and Colbert were 19 and 23, respectively. The three men marveled at the lions, the grizzly bears, and the primates but it was the Siberian tiger exhibit that drew their attention the most. As they approached, they saw the magnificent Tatiana pacing back and forth, the creature's amber eyes fixed on them. Carlos and his friends were in awe of the tiger's size and beauty. They watched as she crouched down, muscles ripping under her thick fur, and then pounced on a toy that had been left in her enclosure. Carlos laughed as he watched the tiger play, but then he noticed something that made his blood run cold. He saw that the wall separating the tiger from the visitors seemed shorter and that it appeared to be lower at one end of the enclosure than the other. 
Carlos pointed this out to his friends, but they laughed it off, saying that there was no way the tiger could jump over the wall. After all, there were barriers and trenches in front of the wall designed to prevent such a thing from happening. Amrit Paul and Colbert decided to do something stupid. The two brothers decided to taunt Tatiana. Colbert picked up a pine cone and tossed it toward the tiger in the enclosure. Tatiana stopped pacing and turned her head toward the brothers. Seeing what happened, Amrit Paul grabbed a stick and threw it in the enclosure. Suddenly, the two began shouting at the tiger, hoping they would get a reaction. Seeing their reckless behavior, Carlos did not want to participate and tried to stop his friends. They listened, but laughed it off. However, it was too late. Tatiana was circling in the enclosure. She jumped from the bottom of the dry moat to the top of the wall, gaining enough height over the top to pull herself over the wall. She eyed Amrit Paul and immediately jumped on him. The tiger's ferocious claws and teeth ripped apart Amrit Paul's skin. As Culber screamed in terror, Carlos tried to save his friend by shouting and throwing things at the angry creature. He then tried pulling Amrit Paul, but this only provoked Tatiana even more. Tatiana focused on Carlos and decided to pounce on him, quickly knocking the 17-year-old to the ground. The tiger then decided to pull him away from the group, mauling him and biting him in the head and torso. Meanwhile, Amrit Paul and Kolba ran for their lives toward the zoo cafe 300 yards away. However, since it was already closing time, the cafe was locked. Although the two brothers screamed for their lives, the cafe employees did not think much of it, suspecting that the screaming person was mentally ill and there was no actual animal attack. Eventually, Tatiana arrived at the vicinity and began attacking Clover. Finally, the cafe employee called 911, prompting emergency services and armed authorities to respond. I don't know if they're on the but they're screaming about an animal that had um, attacked him, but there's no animal out. He's talking about a third person, and I don't see the third person. Is he saying that he was bitten? It's the same as a dog now, and he's going on with him, he's not drunk. Is he saying, is, he, is the patient saying that he was bitten by an animal? He's saying that he's bitten by an animal, but uh, there's no animal case, but he could just be crazy. Okay. okay. Four police officers were dispatched to the area, and the entire zoo was locked down to prevent Tatiana from escaping. What the officers saw, however, was a gruesome sight. It was Tatiana biting down on Culber while Amritpal was on the ground, bleeding and screaming for help. The officers pointed their guns at the creature, but they hesitated for fear of hitting Culber. One of the officers created a distraction, forcing Tatiana to focus on them. As Tatiana angrily turned her attention to the noise, the officers shot her in the forehead, effectively killing the magnificent beast. When the paramedics scoured the scene, they found Carlos dead near the tiger enclosure. He had blunt trauma to his head and neck, scratches and bite marks to his head, neck, and chest, and skull and spinal fractures. His jugular vein was also severed in half. In the immediate aftermath of the attack, the zoo was closed while authorities investigated the incident and assessed the safety of the animal enclosures. It was learned that the walls for the enclosure were only 12.5 feet high, as opposed to the standard of 16 feet. The surviving victims, Culber and Emritpal, received medical treatment for their injuries. The attack also sparked widespread public concern about the safety of zoos and the treatment of captive animals. Some criticized the zoo for failing to properly secure the tiger enclosure, while others questioned the ethics of keeping wild animals in captivity. While Culber and Emritpal filed a lawsuit against the zoo, there were some interesting developments in the case. The subsequent investigations revealed that the three had alcohol in their system. Emritpal had twice the legal limit for operating a vehicle. For Carlos and Culber, it was still under legal limits. However, authorities also found evidence of from the three men. On December 25, 2008, a life-sized sculpture of Tatiana was unveiled at the community garden on the Greenwich Steps at 274 Greenwich. A year later, the lawsuit between the two brothers and the zoo was settled for $900,000.
Meanwhile, a lawsuit by Carlos's parents was settled on undisclosed terms. In that same year, Amrit Paul was sentenced to spend more than a year in state prison due to run-ins with the law, including probation violations, evading arrests, and speeding. Additionally, after filing the lawsuit, Amrit Paul was immediately arrested on suspicion of shoplifting. In 2012, Culber died of undisclosed reasons at the age of 24. It's very obvious from public records that the two brothers were likely provoking Tatiana, causing her to wreak havoc. Additionally, it was doubly sad that after Carlos tried saving his friends, they ran away from him to desperately save themselves. Ultimately, the aftermath of the Siberian tiger attack was a somber reminder of the dangers of interacting with wild animals and the importance of maintaining proper safety measures to prevent further tragedies. This story goes to show that even while visiting a zoo, accidents still happen, and if you aren't careful, it can lead to your terrifying final affliction. The following story has few concrete details. It seems that no one is willing to talk openly about what happened at a small private zoo in Russia on December 2, 2017. Set within the Istra district, located 25 miles west of Moscow, lies the village of Abnavieni Trud. The locals seem to be a close-knit community, that is, except for one local in particular. Sergei Alexandrovsky made his millions in the airline industry, currently the chief executive officer at Rossiya Airlines. He spent his money on another passion of his, animals. In the early 2000s, he set up a private zoo at his home in the village. He opened it to paying guests. It was more of a menagerie than a zoo, with animals held in small enclosures, isolated and with little in the way of environmental enrichment. In 2020, Russia passed a law that meant keeping many exotic animals privately was banned. This was for the welfare of the animals as well as the safety of the owners. However, before the law was passed, it was relatively easy for civilians to purchase and keep exotic pets within Russia. Those purchased before 2020 are allowed to be kept until the end of their natural life. Some locals in Sergei's village didn't like having the zoo animals on their doorstep. It made them feel uneasy and unsafe. At night, they heard the roaring of the lone lion. They heard its constant deep grunting as it paced up and down in its enclosure. It was something that many described as annoying, but the animals wanted to get out. They wanted to escape. It was deemed a dangerous neighborhood for fear of what lurked in Sergei's backyard. As well as housing a lion and a tiger, Sergei Zhu was also home to a black panther whose name was Milan. After 10 years without incident, except for some disgruntled neighbors, something was about to go horribly wrong. Security wasn't as tight as it perhaps should have been. People could walk right up to the big cat's cages, just inches from the animal's faces. Although the details are sketchy and the following is a presumption from the zoo's owner, Sergei, it seems the most likely explanation for what happened that day. A Ukrainian man was staying with two of his friends nearby. It was a reunion of sorts, and the three of them were enjoying plenty of drinks when they decided to visit the zoo. Under the influence of a significant amount of alcohol, they began to behave mischievously, and one of them claimed that he could feed the Black Panther. He was bold and brazen, fueled by the alcohol in his system and the confidence it gave him as he walked up to the enclosure. The holes in the black metal mesh were too small to put his hand through, so instead he decided to try the gate. It was locked. The panther was lying, resting on its wooden shelf inside one section of its enclosure. It lifted its head and watched the man as he tried to work out how to get in through the gate. Its placid appearance lulled the man into a false sense of security. Despite having been locked up its entire life, the panther was anything but docile. It still had its killer instinct, and the foolish man was about to enter its territory, its domain. The one thing that belonged to it, and the one thing that it could instinctively protect. The Ukrainian man managed to break the lock and force his way into the enclosure. The second he stepped foot inside, the Black Panther leapt down from its shelf, 
It trotted over to the man and, without hesitation, leapt onto him. Black Panthers are melanistic variants of leopards or jaguars, and it has not been divulged which species this one was. Both stalk their prey, getting within feet of it before pouncing on top of it. Leopards dispatch smaller prey by a single bite to the back of its neck, severing the spinal column or crushing the skull. They kill larger prey by suffocating it with a bite to the throat. Jaguars typically subdue their prey by a bite to the back of the neck. They have the third strongest bite force after lions and tigers, but the strongest relative to their size. They can clamp their jaws down with a force of 1,500 psi, enough to crush a human skull. Whichever species this one was, it was a formidable predator. The man leapt when the jaguar jumped down off its shelf. The hairs on the back of his neck stood on end. His heart began pounding, and he realized just how stupid he had been. He had foolishly assumed the panther would remain on its shelf and allow him to hand feed it. But as it leapt onto him, he was brought crashing down to the cold, hard stone floor. He let out a cry. In the seconds before the fatal bite, he could feel the warmth of the panther's body on top of him. He could feel its heavy weight as it pinned him down. He couldn't move. He couldn't push it off him. The panther's eyes were fixated on its prey. In his final moment, he felt the warm, moist breath of the panther as it closed its jaws around his throat. He struggled to breathe. The pressure on his windpipe grew, and he knew this was the end. The big cat's canine severed an artery as it bit down harder, and blood poured out of the wound. Moments later, the man was still. It is assumed that his two friends fled the scene. Whether they had run to get help or to escape is not known, but they left him there on the gray slate floor of the enclosure, breathing his last breath. The Black Panther didn't eat the man. Instead, it stood up and raised its nose in the air. It walked over to the gate and sniffed it. The gate had been left unlocked. The panther pushed it with its nose and it swung open. Tentatively, the panther stepped through it. It was out. Nobody noticed it, and when it leapt over a fence and off the property, it disappeared into the surrounding neighborhood. Later, the man's body was discovered. Other visitors screamed when they saw him lying on the ground, a pool of dark blood around his head. Then it dawned on them, the cage door was open. The Black Panther was out and about somewhere. It was lurking in the neighborhood and could attack at any moment. A local walked his dog along the street unaware of the potential danger he was in. Crucially, nobody was informed of the Black Panther incident at the time. The authorities were called to the scene and Sergei Alexandrovsky arrived at the Panther's enclosure. Initial reports were that a keeper had been killed because of the uniform the man was wearing. But Sergei denied knowing the man, saying that he did not work there. He suggested that the man was drunk and entered the enclosure on a dare. It seemed like a possibility. But at that moment, the most important thing was to find the Black Panther before it could cause any more damage. Nobody knew where it was, and there hadn't been any reported sightings. Instead of informing the locals and warning them to stay indoors, the authorities decided that they didn't want to make a fuss or cause alarm. It was better if they dealt with the situation privately, without the public getting involved. It took several hours before the big cat was located. It hadn't gone far and was found crouched underneath some undergrowth, probably scared in its unfamiliar surrounds. When it was eventually recaptured, Sergei insisted that it should not be killed. When locals found out what had happened, there was outrage, not least of all because they hadn't been informed that the cat had escaped. Children had been playing outside. People had been walking their dogs. Anybody could have been attacked in the hours that followed the incident. Some said that they wished it had been Sergei who had been killed by the panther. At least then, maybe his zoo would be shut down and they could walk their neighborhood without fear. An investigative committee that deals with serious crimes in Russia was sent to work on the case. They needed to determine the cause of death and the handling of the situation. No conclusions from the report have been published, and the name of the deceased has never been disclosed. As of this day, the Black Panther was never put down. It was deemed a defensive attack as the man entered its cage unexpectedly. 
The zoo also remains open for business, the animals waiting for the day that someone else opens up one of their cages so they can bring someone else to their terrifying final affliction. Mafui is a small village in the eastern province of Zambia. Known as a gateway to South Luangwa National Park today, Mafui is a popular tourist hotspot and wildlife conservation area. Its most notable attractions include safari tours, camping sites, and lodges where patrons can get up close and personal with elephants. However, our story takes place in the 90s when Mafui was not as tourist friendly as it is today. In the hot summer of 1991, two boys were playing in the plains after sundown. They were supposed to have been back in the village before the big orange sun sank on the horizon, but they were enjoying their game so much that they lost track of time. As the sun set, there was no point in playing in the darkness, so they began their long walk home, hoping their parents would understand and excuse their tardiness. As they walked, they talked about their adventures that day and made plans to hang out again soon. Little did they know that they were being stalked by a deadly predator who was hiding in the tall savanna grass, waiting patiently for the right time to strike. As the boys got to a point where the road split into two, a great lion suddenly sprung out and knocked one of the boys to the ground before they even had a chance to blink. The lion wasted no time in biting the boy's neck and almost immediately rendering him quiet and subdued. The boy was dead in just a few short seconds. Shocked and panicked at the sight of seeing his friend murdered, the second boy ran for help. He stumbled through the dark, moving as fast as his legs would take him, and after breathlessly running for quite a distance, he found some game rangers who helped him call the authorities. The game rangers rushed to the attack scene, firearms drawn, but it was too late. The lion was gone, and all that remained of the dead boy were tattered bits of his clothing, parts of his chewed up skull, and fragments of bone. That young boy was the man-eater's first victim and the beginning of its reign of terror. About 30 days after the boy's life had been gruesomely cut short, a woman was walking around the outskirts of the village gathering supplies for dinner. She needed some herbs and firewood and it wasn't uncommon for her to get these things at the edge of the village. When she had finished, she walked back home, set her items down and began her usual evening routine. The woman did not know that she had an unwanted visitor who had been following her carefully home. The giant lion stalked up to her front door, knocked it down, and entered her home. Before the woman could register what was going on, the lion pounced on her. It bit and clawed at her, trying to quickly subdue her just like it had done to the boy. Valiantly, the woman tried to fight back. She struggled desperately to get the lion off of her, but it had the size and surprise advantage, and soon her injuries were too significant for her to do anything but lie helplessly as the lion took her life. The lion left once it was done with her, and upon discovering the harrowing scenes, authorities searched the bushes around the house for clues as to where it had gone. They did not find the lion, but they did find the woman's remains. Her head and arms lay haphazardly in the bushes. The lion had eaten everything else. Her remains were later buried, but the lion was far from done hunting. The very next night, a young man and his friends planned to sneak out of their homes and meet up. Like many teenagers, they simply planned on messing around and having fun while the village slept. As one of the young men walked through the darkness on his way to the meeting point, he was jumped by the lion right in front of the game ranger's office. He was immediately knocked to the ground and the lion proceeded in its usual fashion, biting and clawing him around his head and neck. Overhearing the attack, the game ranger on duty jumped to action and fired his rifle in the air. Startled, the lion bolted and disappeared into the wild grass once again leaving the young man bleeding on the ground. He was taken to the hospital almost immediately, but he had lost a lot of blood from the severe lacerations the lion had left on his head and neck. The man-eater did not get to feast that night, but the exhausted and injured young man succumbed to his injuries. The community had lost another person to the vicious lion. Unfortunately, the story doesn't end there. Over the next few weeks, three more people died at the paws of the lion. One was a village woman the lion murdered on her porch just outside her door in broad daylight. As usual, the lion lay low in the grass, waiting for a moment when it felt confident enough to strike. As the local group of game rangers approached the woman to warn her about the attacks, the lion ambushed her right before their eyes. She didn't have a moment to react and the rangers could not respond in time. One of them quickly fired a shot in the air and another at the beast, but the damage had already been done. The lion had inflicted fatal wounds on the woman and there was nothing the game rangers could do to help. She died before she could make it to the hospital. 
So far, the man-eater of Mafui had claimed the lives of six victims, and both the villagers and authorities were at a loss on how to take down this murderous beast. As female lions are the primary hunters of the pride, the authorities took short hunting trips to cut the local lion pride down by a few individuals. In August 1991, they randomly chose a lioness from the pride and shot her dead, but the attacks continued. The man-eater's last victim was a woman named Jesline from the Luangwa Valley village of Negozo. Jesline had been on the edge ever since she'd heard of the attacks. No one knew where the lion would strike next or if it would strike next, and it was disturbing to think that such a beast could still be on the loose. She had just bagged her laundry to take down to the river the next day for washing, and with that plan in mind, she laid down in bed and went to sleep. While she slept, the man-eater broke through her door and dragged her from her bed with its teeth and claws. Jesline screamed in pain and terror, shouting for help as the lion carted her off into the bush. The lion devoured her body and bolted off, frightening the villagers. With each attack, the lion had become more confident in its skills and cunning. This time, it didn't stop at just eating Jesline. By the afternoon of the next day, the lion was back. The villagers watched in terror as the giant lion swaggered confidently through the village and into Jesline's hut. It remained inside for a few minutes before it strutted right back out, carrying her bag of dirty laundry in its mouth. For some reason, the lion took her dirty laundry with it into the bush, likely because it smelled like its last meal, or maybe it wanted a trophy for its kill. Peering out the windows, her neighbors banged their pots and pans in an effort to scare the lion off, but their actions only seemed to encourage it. The predator calmly carried the bag to the center of the village and set it down. Then it let out a mighty roar, looking around at the huts as if daring someone, anyone, to come out and defy it. Of course, no one would dare, and the lion, satisfied, picked the bag up again and strutted off into the bush. Through the following days, the lion was seen playing with the laundry bag like a house cat with a ball of yarn. It would swat at the bag, pounce on it, chew it, and roll it around. The villagers could hardly believe what they were seeing. It was at this point that they deduced that the beast indeed could not have been an ordinary lion. No, the man-eater of Mafui was a demon and by playing with the bag it was casting evil spells. Better still, they decided a sorcerer had changed into a lion to terrorize them. The lion's murderous spree was so disruptive and its actions so disturbing that professional hunters visiting the area decided to see what they could do to get rid of the predator. The first hunter to attempt dispatching the lion was a Japanese bounty hunter who specialized as a hired hitman. The bounty hunter set traps all over the area and pursued the lion for weeks, but ultimately ended up unsuccessful. It seemed that the cunning lion was toying with them like it knew when they were watching and when they weren't. Adrian Carr, a local safari hunter, tried his luck next. Along with setting traps like the first hunter, Adrian also set up bait and a blind made of paper bags to try and kill the lion. He hung a carcass about 10 feet off the ground from a tree, then hid behind the blind a short distance away. One night while waiting, Adrian heard the lion's footfalls as it approached the bait. He could hear the beast chewing and he decided to let it eat for a while before putting a bullet in it. After about 20 minutes, Adrian flipped on the spotlight and could clearly see the giant lion standing on its hind legs as it chewed on the carcass. He aimed his rifle at the lion, but the presence of the light sent the lion running into the nearby cover of darkness. Like the previous bounty hunter, Adrian failed to end the lion's reign of terror. The man-eater of Mafui finally met its deserved end when Wayne Hosek stepped into the scene. Wayne was a professional hunter from California, and he'd heard about the beast while visiting the area on a private hunting trip. Coincidentally, his hunting party had come across the lion's toy, Jesline's laundry bag, in a dry riverbed. Wayne and fellow hunter Charles Bukes decided to turn the predator into prey. They set a trap consisting of the laundry bag and a large stash of hippo meat. They set up a hide nearby and lay low in wait for the lion. It wasn't an easy hunt. The men waited patiently for almost three weeks in the hide, but it was like the lion knew they were there and wanted to play. It moved as it pleased, often circling the bait without seeming particularly interested. The hunters moved the side of their hide several times in an attempt to get a jump on the lion, but while moving it, the stealthy lion would slip under their noses and steal the bait, so they'd have to set fresh bait out and try again. This game of cat and mouse, or more accurately, large cat and hunters, went on for weeks. The lion was so elusive that Hosek almost began to believe that it was a demon too. That was until he realized that the man-eater exploited the times they moved locations to get under their noses. The hunters decided to throw a feint. 
They pretended like they were moving so that the lion would let its guard down. They built a blind, left the bay, and hid elsewhere, acting like they were going about business as usual. It worked. The lion approached the abandoned bait, moving confidently. When it got to the open blind, it turned around and snarled. The lion had realized a little too late that it had been tricked. He began to rush towards the hunter's real location, but Hosek was ready. He raised his rifle, aimed, and shot. Bang. The bullet left the gun and landed right in the lion's left shoulder, causing it to crumple into an angry mass of fur and claws. The hunters wasted no time in killing the enormous lion. Its reign of terror had gone on far too long, and now it was finally over. The man-eater of Mafui was dead. Upon its death, the people swarmed out of the village to spit at the animal's corpse and beat it with sticks. The demon was finally gone, and they were not going to pass up an opportunity to celebrate. Local shamans did rituals over its body to make sure that its supposed supernatural powers were banished once and for all. The powerful shape-shifting sorcerer was dead, and they had to ensure it never cast another spell. The man-eater of Mafui was eventually stuffed and displayed at the Field Museum in Chicago, along with its favorite toy, Jesleen's Laundry Sack. The maneless male lion remains there on display to this day. Wayne Hosek, the man who killed the man-eater, would go on to write about it in his 2009 memoir, The Man-Eater of Mafui. All in all, although the total body count for the lion is relatively low for such a feared beast, it has become a local legend, a boogeyman for kids' bedtime stories to warn them about the dangers of playing too late and not looking over their shoulders for stalkers. As majestic as lions are, they are still deadly predators, and a lion on the loose usually spells disaster for any of those who cross its path, its teeth biting you as you cry out in pain before ultimately meeting your final affliction. Situated in India's southwestern region of Karnataka lies Nagara Hole National Park. It is a wilderness stretching for 250 square miles and is covered in dense forests, streams, hills, valleys, and waterfalls. It is home to an abundance of wildlife, including samba and chital deer, Indian leopards and elephants, sloth bears, guar, and the Bengal tiger. Considered one of the biggest wild cats in the world, Bengal tigers can grow to more than 3 meters, 10 feet long, and weigh more than 200 kilograms. They are formidable predators. In this part of India, the tigers share some of their habitat with the locals. It's a dangerous existence for both species, and when tiger attacks occur, it sends shockwaves through the communities. In February 2023, this exactly happened when not one but three members of the same family died in quick succession. Chathan was 18 years old. He worked long hours in one of India's coffee plantations in Nanachi, an area that backs onto dense forest. It is situated in the region of Karnataka, which produces just over 70% of India's coffee. It is grown in the shadow of the mountains, producing one of the best tasting coffees in the world. But for the workers, there were risks working on the plantations. Not only did they work long, arduous hours, but there were risks from the likes of cobras in the long grass and tigers that stalked through the surrounding jungle. Plantation owners rarely paid compensation for injuries or sick leave. Workers were allowed an hour's break for lunch, but weren't given access to fresh water. They had to carry their water with them whilst working in the fields and relieve themselves in the fields. Work began at 8 a.m. and finished at 4.30 in the afternoon. Work was particularly challenging during the harvesting season between November and March. There was significant pressure from the plantation owners to pick all the coffee from the bushes before the season ended, but Chathan was used to this pressure now. Chathan belonged to the Chenukuruba tribe, since the 1970s, the majority of the tribe have been evicted from their homes to make way for tiger conservation. They have been uprooted and relocated outside the reserves. Many of these people, who used to farm their lands, are now agricultural workers like Chathan, harvesting coffee to earn a living. Those in the community who do still farm are subjected to tiger attacks regularly. The tigers see their livestock as easy prey. Goats and sheep are regularly taken by the big cats who are on the hunt. The shepherds run, fearing for their lives, 
and often return later to find many of their flock injured or dead from the tiger attack. It is a difficult life living in the shadow of a tiger reserve, and whilst nuisance tigers are often tranquilized and relocated, the removal only makes room for another tiger to move into the territory. The problem is never resolved for long. Amongst the coffee shrubs, the lone tiger wandered through the cultivated rows. Oblivious to the imminent attack, Chathan continued to fill his blue plastic bucket with coffee beans. He reached up tall to grab each red bean before slinging it over his shoulder into the bucket that was slung across his back. And still the tiger kept moving forwards, inching ever closer to its unsuspecting prey. Its footsteps were delicate along the soft ground. It paused briefly, crouching down lower, when it heard the voice of another worker along one of the rows of trees. Then it continued its stealth-like approach. It was camouflaged in the shade of the trees. The dappled sunlight that settled on the plantation floor hid the tiger, whose body outline was broken up by the orange, white, and black of its fur. Not a rustle was heard not a snap of a twig. The tiger is a masterful hunter. When it was within a few yards of the young Chathan, it rushed forwards, its powerful front limbs thundering across the ground before it leapt out of Chathan's back. He was sent crashing to the ground, the wind knocked from his lungs, his blue bucket sent flying through the air. Moments later, there was a piercing bite to the back of his neck. The force was unimaginable. The warm, moist breath of the tiger could be felt just before it delivered its fatal blow. Chathan had only managed to let out a shocked cry when he was smacked suddenly from behind with the force of the immense tiger. In an instant, it closed its jaws around his neck, suffocating him in seconds. The attack was rapid. The calls from Chathan's co-workers spooked the tiger, and it left its prey and dashed off into the surrounding wilderness. Moments later, screams rang out across the plantation as Chathan's body was found lying motionless on the ground. It was clear he had succumbed to a tiger attack. Terrified workers scanned the lines of trees, their hearts thundering in their chests, knowing the tiger was still out there. As is often the case with Hindus, the body of a loved one must be cremated within 24 hours of their death. Upon hearing of Chathan's attack, his funeral was arranged and his family attended the cremation the next day. To lose a member of the family at such a young age brought unimaginable grief to the family. One of those family members was Chathan's grandfather, Raju. It was a deeply sad ceremony, and to say goodbye to a grandson was heartbreaking. But for the family, things were about to get worse. The following morning at 6.30 a.m. on February 13th, 75-year-old Raju stepped outside his home. He lived near the Hulakal anti-poaching camp close to Nanachi Gate of Nagaraholi Range. He was in tiger habitat. He knew the dangers of sharing his backyard with the big cats, but it was his home. He had made his livelihood there and it was all he had ever known. It had only been hours since he had said goodbye to his grandson, but as he left the comfort of his own home that morning, he was being watched by a predator, a predator that had already tasted human blood just hours before. It was the same tiger that had killed Chathan, and now it was coming for Raju. The tiger had fled the plantation and the body of Chathan, but remained in the area and had now stumbled upon another potential food source. It was just yards away from the door, concealed by the undergrowth. It fixed its eyes on the older man, waiting for the opportune moment to strike. When Raju's back was turned, the tiger decided to pounce. It attacked from behind, using the element of surprise to take down its prey. Millions of years of instinct packed into a muscular and powerful body. Raju let out a groan as he was floored by the predator. Its sharp claws dug into his flesh as it clung onto him with its powerful paws. He tried to put up a fight, but was pinned face down in the dirt. The tiger had struck again, and Raju was dead in seconds. His body was found later that morning by his family. For a tiger to strike the same family twice within 12 hours of each other was incomprehensible. 
When news spread of Raju's demise, it was too much for 56-year-old Jayama to take. She was the third family member to lose her life, but this time it wasn't at the jaws of the tiger. It was from shock and grief. Nothing could bring the three of them back, but many believed that things could have been done differently. The forestry department responsible for maintaining the reserve were strongly criticized by the locals for not searching for the tiger immediately after Chathan's attack. If they had dealt with it then, then they could have saved one, potentially two more lives. In their defense, they claimed that the light was fading and that they planned to send a search party out the following day. But that was too late for Raju. 25 camera traps were set up to locate the tiger. Five elephants were used to search for it and more than 150 field workers combed the thick brush in search for the predator. One camera revealed a tiger lounging in a large concrete tube. It rolled on its back with its paws in the air, oblivious to the hunt that continued outside. The day after the attack on Raju, when the search was in full swing, Deputy Range Forest Officer Ranjan spotted what he thought was the culprit. Skulking back in the coffee plantation where Chathan had lost his life was a tigress. She was old, around 12 years, and had been seen attacking cattle from nearby farms. Typically, tigers in the wild will live for 10 to 15 years. As they reach the end of their lives, they slow down and lose the ability to hunt. Livestock are much easier for tigers to hunt, humans even more so. The team that helped capture the tiger included six veterinarians. They tranquilized her, and when she stumbled to the ground, they lifted her onto the back of a jeep and transported her to the Animal Conservation, Rescue, and Rehabilitation Center at Kurgali. With the deadly man-eating tiger now removed from the wild, villagers in the area are hoping for a long break before another tiger takes someone else to their terrifying final affliction. In Orange County, California, mountain lions prowl from the Santa Ana mountain ranges, foothills and canyons up to the summits. These enormous and agile beasts are a keystone species here as they help regulate the deer populations, keeping the ecosystem balanced for all its inhabitants. Unfortunately, even though mountain lions give birth to several kittens each spring, their population isn't increasing. This is due to vehicle collisions, rodenticides, and habitat loss in the area. Additionally, the ones in the Santa Ana Mountains cannot procreate with other mountain lions in other areas because they are landlocked. As terrifying as they are, mountain lions are actually highly reclusive. They would never go out of their way to make contact with humans as they are generally afraid of us. Moreover, there are no documented cases of mountain lions deliberately hunting or stalking humans. So then, how do we explain the attacks? Some experts believe mountain lions attack because people unwittingly provoke them. Those who accidentally get too close to the creature's kittens initiate a defensive response from the lion. They also react similarly if people get too close to their recent kill. After all, these creatures eat few and far between, so a recent kill might be its first meal in a long time. Nevertheless, unusual cases do happen, as is the case of Mark Reynolds and Anne Hiella. January 8, 2004 was a day like any other. The desert hills of Whiting Wilderness Park had always been inviting and Mark Reynolds was enticed as ever. Mark was a 35-year-old competitive cyclist working for a sports marketing company. He was a dedicated athlete who loved the outdoors and raced bicycles and motocross through rough terrain. Most of the time, Mark would cycle through the trails of Whiting Wilderness Park with his friends. However, today was different. He decided to go into the unpredictable desert hills alone, without a gun or pepper spray. He was experienced after all. Unfortunately, this turned out to be a grave mistake. The trail system is full of twists and turns that stretch for miles. Consequently, people who get lost here may not be found for a long time, not to mention the dangers of lurking predators in the area. As Mark rode his bike through the trail, a sinister force was brewing. Around half an hour into his ride, Mark approached a small climb and pedaled hard to reach the top. Suddenly, the chain broke and hung from the front sprocket. Looking down, he pulled at the two ends of the chain, snapping it in half. The chain had succumbed to the stress of the ride. 
Mark quickly parked his bike beside a bush and crouched over the broken chain trying to devise a solution. Out of nowhere, a mountain lion appeared and tackled Mark, knocking him to the ground. Mark tried to fight against it, but the millions of years of evolution taught the beast to go for prey's vital areas. The mountain lion dug its claws into Mark's shoulders and bit him in the neck and face, suffocating him and cutting off his blood supply. Although Mark screamed in pain, nobody could hear him, he was alone, and Mark didn't stand a chance. When he finally succumbed to the injuries, the big cat dragged Mark's lifeless body into the nearby bush where it would begin to consume him. Angela was heading out with her friend Debbie Nichols for a day of cycling in the desert hills of Whiting Wilderness Park. It was a typical day for the two women. At 19, Anne enlisted in the Marine Corps and was stationed in California. This was the ideal life for her since she had long been passionate about the outdoors. Anne was a hardy woman working as a hydraulics mechanic for helicopters, so it was not unusual that her favorite sport was mountain biking, a sport that required a lot of endurance and toughness. Anne and Debbie loved to ride in the park's desert trails. Their favorite spot was a narrow stretch filled with twists and turns called Cactus Hill. On January 8th, Anne and Debbie arrived at the park after work. They were supposed to do a quick 45-minute ride. However, what was supposed to be another uneventful day for them turned into a frightening encounter. Dropping into Cactus Hill, the two women rode down the trail fast, unaware of the ominous danger ahead. A few minutes into the ride, Anne, who was in the lead, came upon another rider parked along the narrow trail. She stopped and asked him if he needed any help. The man pointed to a parked bike, seemingly abandoned for a few hours. He told Anne the owner wasn't there. It was Mark's bike. Thinking nothing of it, Anne pressed on. She continued down the trail, not knowing the seemingly abandoned bike she saw was a sign of something terrible. Shortly after, Anne came upon a little rise and prepped for the trail's final descent. Suddenly, Anne saw a flash of movement in the corner of her eye. Initially, Anne thought she had startled a deer. However, her suspicions were soon dispelled when she felt the ferocious impact of 110 pounds of pure feline muscle moving at 35 miles per hour. She couldn't even finish her thought when she felt the teeth and claws grab hold of her. Anne was knocked to the ground and in the death grip of a mountain lion. She let out a blood-curdling scream as the lion's razor-sharp claws ripped into her shoulders. The animal was so strong, all Anne could do was cry out, Jesus, help me. The mountain lion grabbed Anne by the back of the neck and tried to move around towards her throat. It dragged her two or three feet and then readjusted its grip, clamping down on the side of her face. The creature separated Anne's ear from her skull. It kept pulling and readjusting, eventually biting Anne's nose and breaking it. Like a hot knife through butter, Anne's cheek peeled away at the unimaginable strength of the lion's bite. Anne punched the lion's face over her shoulder, but it had no effect whatsoever. Eventually, Anne's screams echoed through the trail, and Debbie, who had just arrived around the corner, heard her friend's cry for help. Not knowing what awaited her, Debbie braved the startling situation and ran towards Anne. She was met with a gruesome scene. Debbie saw her friend on the ground painted in blood, and although she was filled with disturbing terror, she was equally enraged at the beast's violent attempt to take her friend's life. Debbie grabbed hold of her only weapon, her bike, and threw it with immense ferocity at the animal. Unfortunately, it had no effect on the frenzied beast. Realizing the animal was pulling Anne down into a ravine, Debbie reacted quickly and ran to her friend. She pulled Anne's leg to try and prevent her from experiencing a ghastly demise. It became a one-sided tug of war. I'm not letting go, I'm not letting go, Debbie yelled as she pulled with all her might, digging her heels into the ground. Eventually, the mountain lion reached Anne's neck and clamped down on her throat. Knowing she was basically dying, Anne looked at her friend as if to say goodbye and blacked out, and it would have been the end of her. Fortunately, other mountain bikers appeared and saw the brutal struggle. They pelted the mountain lion with stones, hitting it in the back of the neck. It worked, and the mountain lion loosened its grip on Anne and took off into the wilderness. Anne became conscious afterward, and the first thing she saw was Debbie desperately trying to call her attention. Anne was shocked that she was still alive. However, breathing was near impossible as she choked on her own blood. The riders and Debbie carried Anne closer to the trail. Anne felt the weight of her mangled cheek hanging from her face. Within 19 minutes, paramedics arrived and placed Anne on a stretcher. She was airlifted to the hospital, where she had to undergo emergency surgery. 
the doctors reattached the nerves and reconstructed her face, miraculously, and survived the harrowing ordeal. The doctors realized if the mountain lion had bitten Anne a few centimeters off, it would have ruptured her carotid artery. It's a good thing you were there, Anne said, as Debbie entered the room in the hospital. After just eight days, Anne was discharged and went on to live a normal life with her family. Although the slight disfiguration of her face from the attack took a toll on her psychological state, Anne was able to get by thanks to her family and friends' support. I don't see scars, I didn't see injuries, all I see is my beautiful wife, said Anne's husband. Anne was fortunate there were people around her at the time of the attack. However, Mark wasn't so lucky. When the helicopter airlifted Anne, they noticed a body on the ground. It was Mark. The unfortunate incident prompted the California Department of Fish and Game to hunt for the rogue mountain lion. After exterminating the creature, authorities performed a necropsy on the animal. They extracted tissues of the lungs, skin, and liver from Mark's body. However, the question remains, why did the mountain lion attack? In Mark's case, it was probably because he was crouching as he fixed his bike. While mountain lions generally stay away from humans, they are more likely to attack small prey. To the creature, a crouching person and a small, vulnerable animal may be indistinguishable. Afterwards, the mountain lion took Mark into a different area and partially hid his body for later consumption. When Anne was riding down Cactus Hill, she unknowingly got close to Mark's corpse, prompting the beast to attack in her defense. Soon, Anne became friends with Mark's family and had been active in the Mark J. Reynolds Memorial Fund, a charity that provides bicycles to underprivileged children. Since the attack, Anne has undergone six more reconstructive surgeries, allowing her to return to her normal life as a trainer. Meanwhile, Mark's family sued Orange County for the incident. However, they dropped it after hearing about numerous protests from cyclists claiming they knew about the risks of entering mountain lion territory. Although they tend to be reclusive and actively avoid humans, mountain lions are still dangerous creatures. We should enter their territory with the utmost respect, doing everything in our power to take the necessary precautions. Failing to do so might just amount to your unfortunate final affliction.